Good afternoon. Welcome to this live stream about the gardens of the enslaved community at Monticello with guide Elizabeth Lucas and archaeological field research manager Crystal O'Connor. Please ask your questions in the comments and let us know from where you're joining us. So Elizabeth and Crystal, can you tell us about your roles at Monticello? Sure. I am a guide at Monticello, so I give the various tours that we offer here. And this topic I often talk about during the garden tour and the slavery at Monticello tour. And I'm Crystal, and I'm the archaeological field research manager here at Monticello. So I'm in charge of running the archaeological field work. And as part of that initiative, our department's in charge of plantation survey. So this is where we go out onto the property. Um, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation owns about half of Jefferson's original holdings. We own about 2,500 of those original 5,000 acres. And we're in charge of going out and doing survey on the property um, in order to identify archaeological sites. Um, and then we go back and we further investigate those sites using uh, excavations. Um, and it's our job to tell the stories of both the changing use uh, in land and the stories of the people who lived and worked here um, in the Monticello community on the plantation. And that includes enslaved African Americans. So how do we know that enslaved workers maintained their own gardens on the Monticello plantation? Yeah, so I'll start with that question. Um, we have a couple of lines of evidence, and some are direct and some are indirect. Um, so as far as oral histories go, we have uh, narratives from uh, the WPA records. So these are oral histories that rec were recorded um, in the 1930s as part of the Work Pro Works Progress Administration. Um, we have uh, ex-slaves who have told the stories of um, their time harvesting uh, gardens and, and fruit and vegetables in those gardens and foraging for uh, fruits and nuts on the plantation of where they worked. Um, we also have uh, documents. So we know, for instance, that Thomas Jefferson recorded the location of at least one garden in a survey um, that he did on the Tufton quarter farm. So Monticello is one of the, is one of four quarter farms on the Monticello property. Uh, Tufton is an adjacent farm that he owned and it's, you can actually see it from the, from the Monticello mountaintop. Uh, there was an enslaved man over there uh, named Abram and Jefferson went out one day and recorded uh, a survey of the property and uh, wrote in survey notes, um, how, where, where Abram's garden was located. Um, we know based on archeological evidence that it was about 200 yards from where the house was found. Um, so, so documents are another way that we, um, that we know that gardens existed in the enslaved community. Um, and then finally, we, we know that they exist because they had to have existed. The rations that Jefferson provided, um, that Jefferson allotted simply weren't enough calories to sustain the enslaved workforce, especially during, um, during harvest season. So during uh, the, the really busy times of year, uh, in the 1790s, Jefferson records that the, wheat, that the wheat harvest is basically being harvested for 14 hours a day. Um, and the allotment that Jefferson issued um, simply was not enough calories. It was about 2,500 to 3,000 calories. And for a person in their 20s and 30s, that was not enough calories to, to sustain them. It was also a really bland diet. And so in order to uh, supplement their diet, make it more interesting, um, to give it a little bit more variety and nutrition, enslaved workers were, um, were uh, uh, expected to go out and, and forest, uh, forage and harvest their own crops in addition to uh, supplementing with their own kitchen gardens. Um, we also know from records. So Jefferson and his family members in the household were keeping records. Jefferson had a memorandum book where he's recording transactions and his uh, granddaughter, Ann Carrie Randolph, kept a very detailed account book. And we have an image of that uh, we can show you. And so uh, she was 14 years old. She's keeping these records between 1805 and 1808. And she's listing the names of enslaved people that she's making purchases from. She's listing the, the uh, actual uh, food items that she's purchasing and how much she's paying for these items. And so this, uh, all of these documents give us a lot of evidence of 
uh, what's being grown, um, how much enslaved workers are, are making with these uh, uh, food items. But um, we also see that there are hundreds of transactions. So this was going on often. This was a, a little economy on the plantation. Um, there are about 40 individuals represented in these accounts. And there are 22 species of fruits and vegetables listed in these accounts. And also things like eggs and chickens and ducks, um, other items that the enslaved workers are either growing or, or they are tending to. Um, now, if you uh, have been to Monticello, uh, we have an image here of the vegetable garden. You can see it's a, a vast garden. Um, Jefferson's uh, garden is two acres, a thousand feet long and 80 feet wide. And uh, this is the garden at its peak in the summertime. So um, you can see the bean arbors there, but um, 330 varieties of vegetables were grown over Jefferson's lifetime in this garden. Uh, but because Jefferson was so interested in experimentation, uh, this was not the most productive garden. So a lot of these experiments came at the expense of production. And a lot of visitors uh, kind of assume that this garden provided food for the entire plantation, but this was food for Jefferson, his family, and his visitors alone, uh, though it was tended by his enslaved workers. Uh, now, uh, another uh, thing that's kind of curious and visitors are surprised by is that this sort of economy was even going on on plantations. So uh, the fact that a slave owner is buying things from his enslaved workers. And this wasn't unique to Monticello. We know this happened on other plantations, Mount Vernon, for instance. Um, and some slave owners thought this was a good practice. Uh, they thought it um, was useful in um, allowing the enslaved workers a little means of independence, a means of making a little bit of money. It kept them tied to the land uh, and it um, might have kept them more content in their situation. Uh, other slave owners thought that this, uh, this means of self-sufficiency, this independence was uh, too much and that it might um, make people revolt or uh, attempt to escape. So not always happening, but certainly Jefferson saw this to be in his best interest and was practicing this at Monticello. Um, we also know that Jefferson is kind of relying on this practice. Uh, he's not producing enough food uh, in that vegetable garden mainly because of these experiments. He's also not concerned about storing food over the season, over the winter. So in his cellars, there are no storerooms for vegetables, no root cellars. Um, but he does have a lot of storage set aside for luxury items like uh, capers. He has olive oil stored, Parmesan cheese, macaroni, and European wine. Can you tell us no, um, what we know about how enslaved people were growing their own food? Like where were their gardens and when would they have been able to tend to them? Let's, um, let's show a little video first. We've got a video talking about the uh, items that Jefferson is storing in his uh, 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 cellar rooms um, and talking about some of these luxury items. And because of the times, it means that there was food coming from all over the world. I'll give you an example, and I think we have maybe even here um, enough to really to, to give an example. If um, when the ships came in from the great Atlantic world of trade from the South Seas, they brought with them uh, from the Caribbean allspice, from the South Sea islands. Um, uh, Southeast Asia, cinnamon. So those came from a long ways. If you had tea with dinner, of course, you had it came um, with tea. The uh, lemons themselves came from the Caribbean, had to be shipped in because certainly nobody was growing enough lemons here for the amount of, of lemons that the very elite used lots and lots of lemons in their, in their desserts. It was a very, very popular taste. Then you had regional, uh, something that might come from another, um, another farm, 
uh, from uh, Richmond, from Annapolis, that kind of thing that had to be shipped in. And those, and again, those were things like brandies and um, and other spices and cheeses, uh, both sharp and cheddars and other varieties, uh, things that came in, like I say, from the European market. That macaroni that was shipped across the sea and brought in um, here. Then you had, of course, what was grown on the plantation. And that was a wide range at very seasonal. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about um, where their gardens were and, and when they tended them. Um, so we are, are assuming they had plots near their homes and certainly Crystal can speak to more of this or perhaps community gardens. Uh, but the only time they're tending their gardens is when they're not working for Jefferson. So their work went from dawn till dusk. And so typically they are gardening in the evenings or they're gardening on Sundays. And after dark, they might have pots of animal fat that they're lighting to see by. Um, and so these gardens, they were certainly a small source of income, but as Crystal mentioned, they were a necessity. So they are having to spend their free time producing a lot of this produce so they can uh, get enough calories and nutrition uh, for their daily work. Um, we have an image, another image of the vegetable garden I wanna show you. And this uh, shows a, a section of the paling fence. Um, so Jefferson had a, a 10 foot tall paling fence around the entire vegetable garden. And this was put up to keep animals out of the garden. It enclosed the garden and the orchard. It was a three quarters of a mile long. And uh, he also had locks on the gates. And so this uh, suggests that they're concerned about theft. And why would he be concerned about theft? Because he knows the rations aren't enough for people to survive on. Um, so certainly enslaved workers are gonna do what they need to do to uh, provide enough food for themselves and their families. And um, we have an image of the rations here. So they're receiving, each person is receiving a peck of cornmeal, half a pound of meat, often really fatty pork, and four salted fish. And this is for one person for an entire week. Um, so Jefferson was fully intending that his uh, enslaved workers had their own gardens, that they are supplementing their rations. Um, and so, yeah, they have gardens, they have orchards, they have chicken yards, they are fishing, they're trapping, they're doing what they can to produce enough food. And these rations as well, they are uh, producing them themselves. So they are growing the corn, they're harvesting it, they're grinding it, they are raising the livestock and butchering it, they are catching the fish and preserving it. So in essence, the enslaved community is producing all of their own food on the Monticello plantation. Um, I, I once asked a student group, you know, what was missing from this diet of cornmeal, meat, and fish? And someone said sugar. Um, so of course, a, a, a student might say such a thing, and I, I agree, absolutely. There's no sweetener here, right? No sugar, but sugar was definitely a luxury. Um, a, a luxury even for the Jefferson family, although they did have access to it. Um, it might be something that an enslaved worker could purchase with money they earned um, through sale of their produce, um, but probably not very often. But we do have records of the Jefferson family purchasing beeswax and honey. So uh, people might be keeping bees to produce some sort of sweetener. Um, but certainly the main thing that's missing from this diet is fruits and vegetables. And because they're, the enslaved workers are required to have these gardens, they're becoming very skilled gardeners as well. So they're no, they know how to work this land, how to produce enough and produce things that they can store over the seasons. And then also extra to make a little bit of money. Um, to add to Elizabeth's uh, comments, I wanna mention uh, the Elizabeth Hemings home site. So Jefferson recorded her uh, living quarter on a plat, and we were able to confirm its location archaeologically back in 1995 uh, when we were doing our plantation survey in the area. Um, and we, we actually found a scatter of cobbles on the surface, and um, 
at her home site about 60 feet southeast of where she was living. Um, she lived here from 1795 till about 1807 uh, when she died at the age of 72. So she lived at Monticello um, in that spot for about the last decade of her life. Um, so we, so the scatter of cobbles, um, we thought maybe that there was a building located here. Um, and actually, in fact, uh, there's very few artifacts. So whenever we see artifacts, we say, hey, there's a building here. Uh, but that wasn't the case. What we actually saw in that scatter of cobbles is that it had a straight edge along the one side. So we think what happened is that she is clearing a plot of land for a garden. Um, there's a straight edge of cobbles, um, which doesn't happen in nature. Somebody would have created that edge. Um, and this is a place where she would have been um, raising things, like Elizabeth said, like chickens and eggs. Um, she sold three cabbages, uh, Anne Carrie Randolph recorded it in 1805 or 1806. And then back in 1770 and 1780, um, she sold uh, a pullet, which is a young hen, to the Jefferson household, um, and some eggs as well. So these gardens wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been far from where enslaved workers were living. On Mulberry Row, they probably were located right next to their cabins um, where people were living and working. Um, so, so yes. So John wonders if Jefferson introduced crops from the Corps of Discovery or any of his European travels to the enslaved community. That's a good question, yeah. Um, we know in Jefferson's vegetable garden, things like mandan corn were grown, ericra sunflowers, hadatsa beans. Um, we just don't have a lot of documentation about you know, what varieties of things were grown in the vegetable gardens of enslaved workers outside of what is purchased by the Jefferson family. So it's possible that they were growing some of these things and these were part of their own uh, diets, but we just don't know for sure. And that's where archaeology is actually really helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk in a little bit about some uh, evidence of seeds that we found at a quarter site located off of the mountain. Um, to directly answer John's question, it does seem like most of the vegetables and fruits consumed by enslaved workers, they wouldn't have been um, exotic or brought from afar from, um, from the Louisiana Purchase, or um, they would have been kind of locally grown and harvested um, crops that we're still familiar with today. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. So thanks for the question. So from what we know of the uh, crops that the enslaved uh, community was selling, can you tell us what we do know they were growing? And um, then what did they do with the money that they earned from selling the produce? So a lot of what um, enslaved workers were, were growing were things like root vegetables that would preserve. So things like sweet potatoes, onions, uh, carrots. Um, we know that there's corn being grown that's incorporated into the diet. Corn is also a really uh, good thing for things like bees and, uh, beans and peas to grow up. Um, corn is also really easy to incorporate into a lot of meals. Um, uh, there's also um, things that enslaved workers are foraging, uh, foraging uh, things like wild raspberries and blackberries that are being incorporated into the diet. Wild cherries, um, peaches, uh, the diet's also being supplemented by fishing. Uh, the Rivanna River is not far from Monticello Mountaintop. It is downhill, so it is a bit of a hike. Um, but enslaved workers might have been going out um, in their free time or on days off on Sundays to, uh, to go fishing down at the Rivanna. Um, we do know that enslaved workers had uh, storage cellars, so subfloor pits. These would have been uh, safe deposit boxes or holes that were cut uh, into the ground, measuring anywhere from three foot by three foot square to uh, four by six. Sometimes they were aligned with wood and um, or brick in some cases. And root crops were put into these uh, storage pits to kind of keep them dry and to keep the humidity out. Humidity is a killer of uh, vegetables and of food, so it was a good way to preserve food. Um, I'll address what people were buying with the money that they owned from the sale of these crops in a second. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so 
Um, again, the account books give us a lot of information about the most frequent transactions. So we have uh, cabbages were, were purchased most often by the Jefferson family. So there were 51 transactions of cabbages and sometimes these were hundreds at a time. Um, also cucumbers was the second most frequent purchase. Um, there were 23 transactions of cucumbers and sometimes there were 50 dozen sold at a time. So masses of, of produce. Um, potatoes, another common um, item. And so sometimes there were barrels of potatoes sold and other things like simlins, which we know today as patty pan squash, but also watermelon and uh, strawberries, apples. Um, we know that hops were sold. So pounds and pounds of hops sold to the Jefferson family for beer making. Um, and hops is a perennial crop. And so this really uh, points to the fact that some of these gardens were pretty permanent as well, if they're gonna be growing perennial, perennial crops. Um, and uh, these often were sold out of season. So, uh, you know, Jefferson's Garden might have produced enough in season, but they're, they're buying these cabbages and potatoes and cucumbers out of season, which suggests that enslaved workers were either storing them in their subfloor pits, their root cellars, or they're doing things like burying the cabbages and keeping them overwintered that way. Um, there's a transaction from a man named Squire. We don't know his surname, but uh, he sold cucumbers to the Jefferson family in January. So either these were pickled, uh, but they called them cucumbers, or he is using ingenious methods of either cold frames or hot beds, um, putting manure under the soil that would warm up those plants. So really finding ways to make this work and, and uh, produce some income. And it seems like uh, all of the large families on this plantation were participating in this economy. So we have transactions with the Hearns, the Hubbards, Gillettes, Grangers, Hemmings, as Crystal mentioned. Um, and often uh, it is, uh, seems to be a family representative who's the one who's negotiating uh, these purchases. Um, those who are, are, are uh, negotiating most often, uh, Squire and Goliath, these men are in their mid to late 70s. So perhaps they're the best negotiators uh, and getting the best prices for some of this produce. Um, and, and, and when you look at the account books, you can see they're you know, typically you know, a dozen beets or a dozen cucumbers, dozen eggs or around nine pence. Uh, but you see uh, uh, Ann Carey Randall paying more for a dozen eggs at times. So some negotiation might be going on here as well. And one thing to add about the demographics of who's actually um, participating in the transaction. So there are very few um, sort of families with a lot of kids uh, who, are, who are doing the negotiating. So oftentimes it's either younger men with um, young infants under the age of one or older uh, couples who have adult kids, for instance. Um, if you think about it, kids take a lot of work and they eat a lot of food. So all the extra produce is being consumed by particular families. Um, so, so the account books are a little skewed in the favor of people who have the extra time to raise a garden and who don't have extra mouths to feed. Um, so yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great source of information. Um, as far as um, what, in, what individuals are purchasing um, with the money they earn from these transactions, um, they're, they're purchasing a lot of really cool objects. Um, Monticello is part of a really expansive Atlantic economy. Um, these people are not on, living on the frontier. Uh, these people are really engaged in the market economy. They're, they're consumers and they're producers. Um, so that they produce the vegetables. They, in a couple of transactions we have in the account books that they're selling baskets to the Jefferson household. Um, so they're, they're uh, producing and consuming goods by going to, uh, to the market on their day off, either down in Milton uh, which is a nearby town or in Charlottesville. Um, we have a couple of objects that I kind of want to highlight. Um, so Elizabeth had mentioned sort of permanence on the landscape um, and permanence is evidenced um, sort of indirectly 
by these giant uh, stoneware vessels. So this is the top of a, of a stoneware jug and this is a, a jar. Um, these, were, these objects were made in America, particularly after the revolution and then um, England and Germany. Um, and these would have been storage vessels to store extra produce. And we find these oftentimes at uh, quarters where enslaved people were living. Um, we also have some really cool objects from Site 8, which I'm going to be talking about um, in just a bit. But there's more uh, stoneware that we have, more jugs. Uh, we have tobacco pipe fragments. And I, there's an image, I think, with some artifacts um, that have some of the ceramics and um, some of the pipe fragments. Um, there's a kettle piece uh, right here, part of a kettle spout. Um, here's a Spanish real and uh, pieces of stoneware. Yeah, there's the image. Um, you can see a really great piece of Chinese porcelain um, in the uh, lower right-hand corner of the screen. So these are, these are objects that are coming from all the way around the world. Um, these are not just kind of provincial objects that are, um, that are made locally. Um, we have buckles from Site 8. We have really cool buttons and toothbrushes. Um, so, so these objects are really important to the um, enslaved workers who are going to market on Sundays and um, buying these objects. Um, and I have um, a couple of day books from, um, a couple of numbers from day books uh, for examples of how much different objects cost. Um, so buttons, for instance, on average cost about a shilling and three pence. Um, scissors cost two shillings, and one ounce of thread costs six pence. So these numbers come from day books um, in New London, Virginia, which is in what is now Campbell County, and from Port Tobacco, Maryland from the 1780s. Um, and these objects are, are things that um, shops would have had readily available. Um, we know that women are the ones that are buying kind of these items of personal adornment. Uh, more often than men, but men are more likely to shop at, um, at least enslaved men are more likely to shop at uh, stores in and around uh, Charlottesville. Other things that enslaved workers might have purchased include um, uh, things like textiles and clothing. So these are really common um, and in fact are most frequently purchased at, the most frequent item purchased at stores. Um, other items and objects include um, buttons, tools, combs um, and things like uh, lead shot and food like sugar and molasses and coffee. Um, so it, it's interesting to think about um, gardens being an active part of enslaved laborers negotiating their role in the Monticello landscape and in the community of which they're a part. Um, oftentimes, um, we know for instance that um, sometimes one person would have gone out um, and purchased objects for a group of people, so it wasn't necessarily the whole family going to market. Um, but this, this is a, a really vibrant community that uh, is trying to surround themselves with objects that they, that they want. Um, one other really cool object I want to show um, is this. So it doesn't look like much, um, but it is the base of a locally made coarse earthenware. Um, this would have been made here in near Charlottesville using the local red Piedmont clay. And um, this, these sorts of objects really don't show up in the documentary record, but these would have been used um, either as um, uh, eating uh, things to eat off of, so dishes or as storage vessels. And we know that uh, enslaved workers have a lot of these at Site 8. Um, so they're negotiating in some sort of local economy that's kind of happening under the radar um, to acquire these objects. So this is just part of a vessel. It's not the full vessel. Um, but uh, yeah, they're kind of clunky and utilitarian, but they really tell an interesting story. We have another question from one of our viewers. Kathy is curious to know, um, was rice ever grown by any of the enslaved gardeners here at Monticello? <laughs> yeah, I don't recall rice being grown here. Um, further south, yeah. Yeah. I don't think this is the right yeah, for it. Yeah. I mean, Jefferson was very interested in finding 
a type of rice that would be grown in the Carolinas in, in drier climates because malaria was such an issue where it was grown uh, initially. And he's actually um, bringing rice grains back from Italy, which uh, he wasn't supposed to do because the penalty for that was death. <laughs> but he made it back just fine. But certainly, you know, he's interested in this, but um, he might have had little experiments growing rice, but nothing that was very productive at all. Yeah. Uh, so visitors to the mountaintop today can see um, the very large vegetable garden that we refer to as Jefferson's uh, Garden. But can you tell us what kind of evidence archaeology gives us to locate uh, the garden plots that the enslaved families grew? And do we find them on other Monticello quarter farms? Um, so Abram's Garden, we know from the documentary record, like I would mentioned earlier, um, is over at Tufton. Um, so we know for certain that that's, that's there. Um, they would have existed certainly on other quarter farms um, and other quarters on the plantation. Um, archeologically, I wanna talk a little bit about site eight, which is a site that our department excavated starting in 2000. Um, we excavated this for about a decade each summer. And um, there's four cabins located at this site uh, there's no documentary evidence. The site doesn't show up on any map or any plat or in any letter or survey notes. So we found this using our plantation survey. So this would have been sort of the, the concentration of en uh, enslaved field workers uh, from about 1770 to about 1800. And we date the site based on using, based on artifacts and using ceramics most carefully. Um, so in order to find evidence of gardens at these sites, we use what's called uh, flotation. And this is a process, we have an image of uh, my friend Kira doing uh, flotation um, at, our, at our lab. Um, and here she is. So we use a big tank and we, um, once we excavate something like a subfloor pit, we uh, save samples of the dirt and we put it into this machine called a float tank. And the dirt is agitated by water and all the light uh, objects like seeds and beads float to the top and all the heavy objects like ceramics or uh, bottle glass sink to the bottom. Um, so we send all of those lighter seeds to our colleagues. Um, uh, the, the woman who did the analysis of site eight uh, uh, seeds is from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Her name is Stephanie Hacker and she worked closely with our uh, collaborator, Dr. Candy Hollenbach at UTK. Um, and, and so what Site 8 is able to tell us is kind of a point in time what people are eating and um, foraging for. So archaeology didn't help us find the garden, but they helped us find byproducts of the garden um, and evidence of the, the life ways of enslaved workers. So we're going to get down in the weeds just a little bit with this, but um, it's kind of nerdy, but it's kind of cool. Um, so there's four cabins at this site, and one cabin dates to the 1770s. Another cabin dates to the 17, uh, 1770s, another cabin dates to the 1780s, and two cabins date to the 1790s. And we know that Jefferson during the 1790s switches his main export crop from tobacco to wheat. And um, he's part of the Atlantic economy and he um, is uh, susceptible to the whims of the Atlantic market. And um, it's really cool. It's all related. And, you know, decisions that are being made over in Europe are affecting uh, enslaved workers here at Monticello. So, um, so the shift from tobacco to wheat creates a couple of different results here at Monticello. Um, one result is that enslaved workers have a little bit more free time to actually go out and forage and tend to their gardens and hunt and trap um, and, and find things uh, that, are, that are good enough to eat. Um, in a way that they hadn't been able to during the tobacco period. So during the tobacco period, a lot of people would have been doing gang-based labor, which is where everybody is doing the same task. Um, it's a very, it's hoe-based agriculture. Um, everybody has the same set of tools. Um, but during the wheat period, labor shifts a little bit and um, people are doing more specialized tasks. So there's, uh, there's blacksmithing going on, there's barrel making going on. Um, there's milling going on for the flour over at the mill at Shadwell. So people have a little bit more free time um, and are able to spend that free time, again, going out and finding um, good things to eat. Um, so we do see that shift in the botanical remains that Kira found um, while doing that flotation. 
Um, so during the early period in site eight, um, there's, well, consistently across the board, there's a lot of um, things like corn that are grown. Um, uh, let me find my notes real quick. Um, yeah, things like corn that are grown pretty consistently, um, things like deer, raccoons, opossum, wild game are almost certainly being uh, hunted and trapped. Um, other things that are found uh, throughout different deposits at Site 8 include beans and buckwheat and the English pea, grains and squash. Those are pretty consistent across the board. Um, nuts include um, more acorn, black walnut, hazelnut, uh, black walnut and hickory, um, and fruits including blackberry, raspberry, blueberry, grape, peach, persimmon, and members of the prunish genus, genus which include peach, plum, cherry, and grapes. So this is important because it, it's, uh, enslaved workers are in, a, in a way are taking advantage of the opportunities that they're negotiating while we shift to the wheat crop, um, or while Jefferson shifted to the wheat crop. Um, so, and they're able to purchase with the free time and with the extra money they're making from the sales, um, they're able to go to the market and purchase these store, these stoneware storage vessels and tobacco pipes and, um, buttons and beads and buckles. Um, so we don't, the documentary record necessarily doesn't capture sort of those nuances. Um, and it's really through only through archeology span that we can capture, uh, some of those smaller, um, the, the, the really small transactions within the enslaved community. Um, yeah, so I think that answers that question. Great, hey, thank you. Um, so earlier you talked uh, or mentioned a bit about how uh, uh, these gardens really helped uh, some of the enslaved community members um, kind of navigate and negotiate. Um, can you both talk a little bit more about the significance of these gardens um, uh, for the enslaved population of Monticello? Yeah, so I, I think just kind of to reiterate how I had just wrapped up that last question, um, these enslaved workers were really producers and consumers. Um, this is still a brutal system of slavery and these objects don't negate that, but the fact that enslaved workers were able to grow things in their garden and sell um, and, and try to better their own lot in life, I think is really powerful and meaningful. Um, they're, they're producers and consumers and they're trying to leverage their own um, livelihood here. Yeah, along the same lines, um, you know, these gardens, they were a necessity, they were a requirement. Um, and they also took a lot of labor on their free time but they did provide a small amount of independence, a small amount of control over their lives that they, that they had. So they're able to provide for their families. They're able to make choices about what they're eating, what they're growing, what they're cooking, developing these horticultural and culinary tradition, traditions. And uh, they're able to make choices about what they're purchasing as well. And you know, having these choices, making these decisions really sort of helps make life more meaningful and uh, really uh, helps us seem more like individuals as well. And I, think, I, I hadn't mentioned um, these, the things grown in their garden could have been used as medicinal purposes or for religious purposes. So enslaved workers are kind of taking um, their own um, health into their own hands um, as a way to, to take care of themselves and not just relying on the master for this. Well, Crystal and Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing this such interesting information. And thank you so much for our viewers today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to learn alongside of us. And we hope that you'll stay tuned next week for another live stream. Thanks so much. <laughs>